Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm neither a politician, nor an academic, or an economist. I'm a simple accountant. And, but it's interesting, listening to my, the previous speakers, there are some ideas that uh, they have articulated in a much better way than I have, but at least we have a common viewpoint on certain things. So to start with, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to remind you that during the last five years, we've endured um, a, a tsunami of governance failures and chaos in the world financial markets. At home, we've endured the scandals of Dublin Docklands, Anglo, Nationwide, and the cataclysmic collapse of the banking system. These debacles were enabled by a toxic brew of incompetent government, failed governance, hubristic executives, feeble board oversight, unethical corporate culture, poor internal audit and risk management, and inadequate regulation. Just to mean a, a few. <laughs> now, co corporate culture and ethical principles are created by the leadership of good boards. The tone at the top sets the governance standards and the behavior of an organization and the quality of its governance. Two important pillars in effective governance structures are competent internal audit functions and strong independent audit committees. An audit committee has a key role in the governance architecture of any organization. Its responsibilities include the oversight of the integrity of the financial statements, the effectiveness of financial controls, internal controls, and risk management systems. It monitors the internal audit function, approves its annual plan, and ensures that it's focused on the critical risks of an organization. The audit committee and the internal audit uh, function are interdependent. They combine to keep an organization honest and on the straight and narrow. Internal auditors use systematic, disciplined approaches to ev evaluate the effectiveness of all uh, controls and government process. Internal auditors report directly to the audit committee. My main theme is that a radical reform and enhancement of the status of internal audit services and audit committees in the state bodies and government departments could play a vital and critical role in public sector reform. Finally, if I get the time, I'd like to comment on some of the more egregious aspects of DEPFER's efforts at reform. Governments are accountable for the service they, they provide to taxpayers and how they best utilize resources to deliver them. Administrative and fiscal accountability is set by robust controls, budgetary and legal compliance, and timely financial reporting. Well-resourced audit committees provide assurance on accountability, focusing on fiscal and administrative responsibilities and reporting. A decade ago, the Malarkey Report was the catalyst for setting up public sector audit committees. I supported the creation of these committees and I recognize their value. But the present system has both many flaws, but also significant possibilities. So far, these seem to be ignored in the scramble for the lifeboats, the reform lifeboats, and the frantic pumping of the bilges by Captain Howland, Boson Hayes, and their crew at Detfer. In this time of severe financial constraints, pressure on service delivery, and concerns about value for money, effective oversight of expenditure has become another task for public sector audit committees. It is a major concern that most of these committees are seriously under-resourced. As the expectations of audit committees grow, without additional and internal audit resources, the task is becoming even more problematic. The Code of Governance, the latest one for state bodies in 2009, I'll refer to this in future as the guidance, requires bodies with more than 20 employees to establish an audit committee. It makes recommendations about their membership and the responsibilities and directs the MACs, the management committees and government departments and, it, and state boards to put in place systematic procedures to identify risks, to assess their possible impact, to manage them and to prevent and detect fraud. Monitoring these procedures falls to the audit committees and the internal auditors. Now, in an environment when the funding of all state bodies and government departments has been reduced, and will continue for the next few years, more risks emerge. Added to these are the risks arising from the loss of key staff opting for uh, early retirement and the resultant weakening of internal controls. The guidance sets out the duties of suitably constituted internal audit functions, and there, uh, it goes into great detail about their remit, but that remit includes monitoring compliance with procurement, with value for money and governance standards, as well as all kinds of other duties. The guidance is very long in requirements, but it's very short in how these are to be met. Significantly, it's silent in how the internal audit functions are to be staffed or trained. There's no mention of how skilled internal auditors 
capable of carrying out the increasingly demanding roles are to be recruited or to be managed or rewarded. So while it places further responsibilities on public sector audit committees, it fails to address the under-resourcing of the internal audit service. Based on my own experience, I want to mention how the reality of some public sector internal audit functions falls far short of the aspirations of the guidance, and how under current arrangements, their audit committees cannot hope to carry out their responsibilities effectively. I'll mention six worrying issues about the resourcing and staffing of departmental and some state body internal audits. Most staff assigned to departmental internal audit services are not adequately trained. Fewer qualified accountants or auditors. The, in fact, the internal audit service remains the Cinderella of the public service. With few exceptions, the internal audit staff in these bodies don't have the skills required to perform their work. The, the guidance directs that, quote, the head of the internal audit function shall have considerable seniority within the organization. And it goes on to say, the internal audit function should be properly resourced with the necessary skills, including the ability to deal with non-financial aspects. This is, in fact, not the case in most departmental and state bodies because internal audit staff don't come from the senior ranks. Thus, a key recommendation of the guidance is not followed. Now, currently, with few exceptions, junior officials are assigned to the internal audit role for a couple of years. If they show some promise, they're usually promoted or moved up or out or assigned to other duties, just as they've begun to develop some degree of competence and skills or attain some qualifications. Staff assigned to internal audit must be strong and tenacious characters. Occasionally, I, from my own experience, I know of junior internal auditors having to cope with uncooperative senior officials who may dispute very aggressively their audit findings and conclusions. Thus, there's potential for the internal auditor to be bullied and intimidated. And this attacks the essential requirement of an internal auditor, and that is to be independent. Now, I also disagree with the widespread use of external contractors to augment public sector audit services. From time to time, there may be a need to hire in specialists to carry out reviews, for example, of complex computer applications. And I recognize there may be some short-term benefits in engaging contractors to fill skill shortages. And I accept, too, that in small organizations, there is a case for outsourcing the uh, internal audit service. However, the habitual hiring of contractors into the public sector audit service is a very costly drain on the financial resources of an organization. In some cases, it's been used simply to bypass understaffing or a device to bypass the recruitment embargo. Price is a key concern in the selection and hiring of contractors. So the contractor's ability and competence may not be the best available, and their work may be neither of the highest quality or good value for money. There are multiple disadvantages to the constant use of these contractors. There is virtually no knowledge transfer to the core internal audit staff of the service. It's a poor long-term management strategy. There's no increase or growth of the institutional or corporate memory. It militates against skills development, and the policy un ultimately undermines any progress in the development of these services. Now, I contend that if DEPFER is serious about reform, and if real value is to be gained from the work of public sector internal audit, a completely new structure is required urgently. To enable the public se sector internal audit service to meet the ever complex and increasing complex technical and specialized skills, a totally restructured model with a permanent professional core of qualified internal auditors should be established. It should have progressive career pathways and be properly resourced. And this core could be managed by an independent office of internal audit services. These professional internal auditors could be full-time civil servants who might choose a career in the service and it could be augmented by qualified accountants and auditors from the private sector who might wish to spend a period at the Office of Internal Audit Services, perhaps for up between two and four years. And this initiative would definitely raise the standards and the status of the service. It would ensure independence and provide a rewarding career for the internal auditors and ultimately bring value for money for the internal audit service. Faced with the increasing responsibilities and pressures, there are other important desiderata for audit committees if they are to improve their performance. And I'll just mention a few. Usually, um, committee members are paid a very small honorarium, sometimes nothing at all. But money is not the issue. 
well-qualified individuals with relevant ex experience simply do not want to, be, to join these committees. I urged some senior chartered accountants recently to consider uh, joining public sector audit committees, and the most common response I got was, to put it mildly, negative, and I was told that the reputation risks were far too high. Now, it's interesting that although public companies pay their audit committee members substantial fees for undertaking their duties, a survey in the Financial Times last year reported that nearly 70% of the respondents to a Mori poll said they were less likely to accept an audit committee chairmanship than a year before. And the poll provided, I think, clear evidence that directors are very wary of accepting the burdens involved in uh, chairing an audit committee. The skills level of most uh, public sector audit committees needs significant upgrading. And it's essential that all committee members receive proper induction training, and very often they don't. They've got to understand the responsibilities and the different functions between internal audit and external auditors. And they have to have some technical skills and commercial experience, but above all common sense. The reality is quite different in many cases that I know of. And it's worth mentioning that in public companies there is a requirement that at least one member should have recent and relevant financial experience, either as an auditor or as a finance director. Another issue is that all committee members should be independent of management. And currently, the audit committees in some government departments actually include civil servants, both from the department itself and from other departments. Now, although these members at times make a useful contribution, the independence of the committee is compromised, in my view, and it would definitely be enhanced if civil servants from that, those departments were not members of the committee. All committee members should be involved in the work and the functions uh, of, of the committee and participate in the discussions. They should be what the late uh, Robert Higgs called constructive challengers. If one or two members are ineffectual, then the chairman should uh, notify the board of this or he should notify the secretary general. Okay, just, um, I, I just would mention that the attitude of the max in government departments is very important. And there should be regular contacts between the audit committee chairman and the, uh, the MAC, and regular presentations should be given. If the MAC or, or the, the State Board does not show a good response to the recommendations of the Audit Committee, there's a serious problem. And ultimately, if they're not accepted, the Chairman should resign. Talking of Chairman, our own Chairman, uh, Eddie Malloy, has pointed out the absurdity of the Department of Finance clinging irrationally to the Victorian civil service concept of the gifted generalist. He contended that this ingrained think thinking contributed to the failures of finance, the central bank, and the regulatory system to read and understand the warnings uh, leading to the banking and financial crisis. And he pointed out that at the time, certainly, the Department of Finance didn't have the professional skills in economics, banking, accounting, and human resources management to ca carry out their functions. So I would contend, if we are serious about public sector reform, it's time for DEFRA to be much more proactive in slaughtering some of the sacred cows that graze around Merrion Street. But to mix the metaphor, do turkeys actually vote for Christmas? If civil service structures, more reminiscent of Trevelyan than Whitaker, are not fit for purpose or, or obstruct organizational reforms and change, isn't it time to dismantle them? In recent times, there, ha there has been some hiring of skills, of course, into the Department of Finance. But I would argue that we must go much further. If there is a genuine commitment to public sector reform, we have to be more creative and imaginative. What would be wrong about a new cooperation paradigm, a structural strategic accord between the public sector and the private sector? We could develop a continuing program of secondment of specialist skills from the private sector into major government departments. And I'm talking about bringing people uh, like experienced uh, managers, lawyers, economists, as Francis said, and accountants who might spend periods of attachment for between two and four years in the public sector. Of course, with our unshakable belief in the concept of the generalist, don't forget that we're the boys who in the past sent a skip driver, and more recently a man who had trouble counting to be a member of the European Court of Auditors. <laughs> Ironically, the generous and largely uncontrollable ex uh, expenses regime in the Oireachtas is in stark contrast to the niggardly reproach of the resourcing of the internal audit services. There remains a deep public anger about the expenses available to members of the Oireachtas and about expense abuses, perhaps mostly in the past, by officials, board members, and ministers in some government departments and state bodies. But the entitlements culture is deeply embedded 
in Irish society and in the public sector. And this cannot be permitted to continue. It will take courage to say stop and instigate root and branch reform to these expenses schemes. Um, Audit committees should be shouting about this scandal. And I have to confess that when I was chairman of the Audit Committee in the Houses of the Oireachtas, I failed to drive through real reform of the expense system. And despite tinkering with that system, it still isn't fit for purpose. It fails to deal with the lack of vouching and transparency. And I come, as I said, as a simple accountant, I believe that actually people should not be reimbursed for expenses they haven't incurred. <laughs> Turning to reform, some attempts by Deptford to pluck some low-hanging fruit have only added insult to injury. I give two examples. First, the ill-conceived diktat called One Person, One Salary that was issued last November that requires public servants who serve in state bodies or audit committees not to be paid fees as members or directors. In my direct and personal experience, skilled academics as public servants either resigned or declined appointments to state boards and audit committees because of this piece of bureaucratic claptrap more worthy of Pyongyang than Pembroke Row. And equally galling is the cack handed advice from DEFRA that state body directors should consider waiving their fees. I suggest that the Minister would be on far firmer ground if once and for all he took a sign to ministerial and neuropta salaries, allowances and expenses, and the emoluments of unelected advisers. And while he's at it, he should end the payment of ministerial and neuropta pensions to individuals who are still not of pensionable age and to some who brought this country to its knees. No. <laughs> finally, finally, Chairman, uh, leaving expense abuses aside, could audit committees in the last seven or eight years have done more to protect the public interest by questioning some of the appalling money-wasting decisions by the government? Should they have, for example, been more proactive in expressing concerns about the misuse of taxpayers' money? Should they have brought these concerns to the Public Accounts Committee? Should they have questioned the light-touch regulatory culture? Should they have spoken out against the decentralisation debacle and the reckless squandering of public money relating to the most of the decentralisation decisions? Should they have condemned the redeployment and loss of key staff and skills and the associated institutional memory? Should they have denounced the pork barrelling decisions on the bizarre relocation of some of these departmental services to ministers, hometowns or constituencies, which owed much more to electoral expediency and gross cronyism to any, than to any public need or value. On the pure reflection, I think if the committees had been better trained and resourced, there's no doubt they should. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've simply offered a personal view based on my experience on state audit committees. A chairman must be independent have the courage and integrity at times to accept that taking an independent stance may incur the wrath of civil servants or even worse ministers, but he can take some comfort from the words of Dr. Johnson who said, the advice that is wanted is commonly unwelcome and that which is not wanted is evidently an effrontery. Now, most people join audit committees from a wish to be of public service to protect the, rep the reputation of the organisation and the interests of the taxpayer. They expect that their bona fides be accepted and their advice acted upon. And in truth, this has been my experience in most of the audit committees where I've been involved. But if audit committees are to be major drivers of public sector reform, and if the state is to realise the true value of public sector internal audit services, radical changes, new thinking and imaginative structures are essential now. Thank you very much indeed.